Dedication and Preface to From Mud to Mufti. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Mud to Mufti, with Old Bill on All Fronts by Bruce Bairn's father. Dedication and Preface. Dedicated to my mascot mother, who, though way back at home, has helped me so much in inspiration through all these years of war, and who, in her anxiety, has endured more than I have. Preface to the American Edition From Mud to Mufti Here it is, my latest melange from the mud. A story of ups and downs on all fronts. Chiefly ups. Provide hospital reports. A further story of my own charmed life as I wandered round the war. The thing it deals least with is war, for, as will be seen in the text, my later existence in the turmoil consisted very largely of adventures behind the front lines, travels, painful and otherwise, in all directions. Many years ago, when the war began, I mean, I started a somewhat varied and uncomfortable career in the trenches. These first adventures I recorded in a book, Bullets and Billets. And now the second half of my wartime life is set forth in this mud to mufti. Having concluded both these works, I find myself very largely in a sort of stupefied or comatose state, wondering how it is I have been alive to write either. Something like a wasp feels, I should imagine, who having been trodden on, finds he can still walk away. The pen is mightier than the sword. Some well-known comedian has remarked that fact. But I can truly say there have been many times when I should have been sorry to have had nothing better than a pen. This Mud to Mufti was written and illustrated at all sorts of times and all sorts of places, and possibly it may interest Americans to know that much of it was done either amidst them in France, or not so far from the shadow of the Woolworth building. From August 14 to November 18 is a long, long way. And I can truly say in all the host of varied experiences, some of my pleasantest times have been spent way down in Alsace-Lorraine when America first arrived. I remember so well how my gimlet eye focused on the first American I saw. First impression. Strong, large, and healthy, and wears his hat strap at the back of his head. My ideas for pictures have come to me in odd places, as anyone reading Mud to Mufti will see and I remember one in connection with the American front which will illustrate my meaning. I was engaged on a set of drawings of life amongst the Americans, and for this purpose had wandered all over the American front as it existed at that time. I wanted a last picture to complete. I had just finished one which read, Novice, just up for the first time, inquiring way to the front from a sergeant. The sergeant looks at him in silent scorn for a moment, and then says, Wall? You don't know the way. While well, keep straight up this road till you come to a war. Then fight. Well, anyway, I wanted a last picture to complete, and this is how it happened. My visit was over. I was returning from Neufchateau to Paris. I sat in the super-crowded train thinking hard. I couldn't somehow get the sort of thing I wanted, a human, humorous note based on a national characteristic. I got out of the carriage and went into the corridor. It was full of real live American soldiers of the Western brand. I stood and watched them. One next me was looking intently out of the window at some explosive practice which was going on in the country we were passing through. As he impassively watched the explosions, he was rolling a Bull Durham cigarette. This gave me what I wanted. I pulled out my scribbling book and made a rough note. When I got to Paris, I drew a picture of a soldier lying on the ground in the midst of one of those death-charged explosive tornadoes known as a battle. He is rolling a cigarette. And underneath I wrote, When rolling your Bull Durham, always keep the hand steady so that the tobacco lies evenly on the paper. But enough of this rambling of mine. All I have to say is in mud to mufti. But in case I forgot to mention it there, I'll put it down again here. The American army is a damn fine crowd, and for a whole-hearted hospitable time at a mighty rotten period, I had none better. Bruce Bairn's Father End of Dedication and Preface Recording by Philip Gould
Chapter One of From Mud to Mufti. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Mud to Mufti with Old Bill on All Fronts by Bruce Bairn's Father. Chapter One Begins in Hospital. A Surprise Visit. I Find Myself in Request. Those who have endured bullets and billets, and have possessed sufficient mental control and iron determination to finish the last chapter, will remember that, subsequently to being wafted out of the Second Battle of Ypres by a Johnson, I was in due course deposited in a London hospital. This was a large building, one of the finest hospitals in London, I should say. One of those Olympic palaces with endless stone corridors, lifts, rice puddings, and temperature charts but what a harbour of refuge it seemed. I really think it is quite worth while going through an offensive in order to get that marvellous feeling of rest, security, and the good will of human beings which comes slowly over you on admission to one of our British hospitals. After months of saturation in all the excessively masculine and harsh ways of war, to recline in a comfortable bed and watch a nurse moving towards you across a carpet, with nothing more dangerous than a thermometer or a tonic, one feels that the world is a nice, kind thing after all. Those marvellous hospitals, day after day, week after week, month after month, thousands of new cases come in, and yet the staff turn on an enthusiastic and cheery welcome each time with unfailing regularity. One feels that one is the first and only case with which they have had to do. It's the same in all our hospitals, and I've had experience of one or two. I was pretty rotten for some little time, and had to put up with those well-known long and weary days in bed. Days when you look forward to the doctor's visit on his rounds, after which you spend the rest of the time watching the daylight fading into the evening, and then wait for the night nurse to come and take that confounded temperature of yours again prior to wishing you good night. During these days my mind seemed to be going all through the war again, from the day I began. All the varied scenes and episodes I had been in, in which I had taken part, culminating in that big bother at Ypres. All those thoughts went surging through my mind, tumbling and tossing about in fantastic profusion. I rushed into the salient and fired machine guns into writhing hateful masses of Boches, about twice nightly, in my dreams. I think everyone who gets knocked out knows this sensation of fighting one's battles over again. It's just like one of those long perforated paper rolls used in pianolas. You have the tune first, rewind, and then have it all over again. I wasn't allowed to see strangers for some time. Only my mother was allowed to be with me, and she read to me and brought me things. At last came the time when I was pronounced distinctly better. It was no longer necessary to have that Y-shaped tube thing of the doctor's groping its way through my pajama jacket to listen to my heart. Everything seemed brighter, and I was immersed in one enormous, enthusiastic desire to go out and see the world again. Not a sandbag, shell, and corrugated iron world, but to go out and roam at ease midst all the soft and comfortable things of peace and security. At the front one feels it's one's business not to live, but to die. And here I was, after an intervening mystical period of repairs in a hospital, entitled to go forth and place a greater importance on living than on dying. Result? A vast, sparkling joy in life and all the things that go with it. But one's ideas about recovery are always in advance of the hospital's views on the same subject. I had to remain there in spite of my daily protest. I'm all right now, doctor. At this time, as I mentioned in Bullets and Billets, I had done only a few sketches. The first fragments had gone in and been accepted. My Ypres affair and subsequent hospital had temporarily knocked out drawing desires. But now, as I revived, a torrent of ideas came pouring into my head, and I started off again. My mother brought me a sketchbook, and in it I weaved a series of rough drawings depicting various scenes, painful at the time, yet humorous to look back on. Incidents, in fact, of the last few months. Yet the continuation of fragments from France was not for a moment in my mind. The wealth resulting on my first few drawings was perhaps not such as would create a wild desire to send up more. 
but now a certain day arrived. I was beginning to be allowed to see people, and one morning I was told that a gentleman had called to see me. He sent up his card with the announcement that he was a representative of the bystander. I was glad I knew this, as his make-up was an undertaker to the life, and I should have undoubtedly thought that the doctor had been lying about my recovery. A young man of about thirty summers, as the novelists say, entered the room. He placed his funereal bowler and umbrella on a table and advanced to my bed. I shot out a tattooed arm from under the red blanket and shook hands. The bystander presented its compliments and hoped I was better, after which my visitor informed me that the bystander had had applications for the originals of the drawings I had so far sent up, and also complimentary letters. Finally the bystander would be pleased to see any other drawings I might do. I pointed out that I was, at that moment, closed for structural alterations, but on reopening would see what I could manage. The mournful one left. I recoiled into my red blanket and grinned into the pillow. I then sat up and grinned at the room, at my mother, at the bunch of grapes, and the temperature chart. Well, I'm damned. Fancy them wanting some more drawings. A great enthusiasm got hold of me. I should have wanted a mental tennis racket to fence off the ideas which hurtled into my mind. Just wait till I get out of here, I said to myself. And in the next few days I got out of there, and went home to convalesce, and think. End of chapter 1 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 2 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Barron's Father This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 The Medical Board Mystery Awaiting the Verdict Light Duty my home being in the country, a restful recovery was aided in every way. I progressed from day to day and rapidly sailed along in the direction of one of those mysterious and problematic institutions, a medical board. The London Hospital had given me sick leave, marking its termination with a compulsory visit to the above-mentioned medical board. Now a medical board is a curious institution. For very good reasons, no doubt, it has the following peculiarities. You never know where it's going to be held, or when, until a few hours before it comes off. Say you have two months sick leave. Well, you get your notice to attend the medical board at the last place you have thought of, on the last day of that leave. A wire arrives giving time and place in such a way as to leave you a mere wisp of a chance for catching the only train that day to the appointed spot. My board was in Birmingham. I had for some days had my money on Salisbury or Warwick, but just as in the three-card trick, I was wrong again. The Birmingham Medical Board was held in an enormous impregnable building. With a few others I awaited my turn in a vast stone corridor. A row of massive polished doors faced us. On these are the various titles of the different medical and temporary owners. One by one my companions disappeared through one of these apertures. I felt like Ulysses as he watched the Cyclops daily reducing the number of his companions. At last your turn comes. A different door opens to the one you've had your eye on, and a hilarious combatant who has just got another month's sick leave is ejected. Behind him you see the Cyclops, a medical major generally who barks at you from behind the mahogany to come in. Inside you stand before an immense table covered with papers. Behind the table sit two of the board. The third member, there is generally a third, seems to have a sort of roving commission, lurking by the window or standing by the fire, ready, I suppose, to do anything from chucking you out to calling someone else in. You stand before the table. Nobody speaks, but the heaviest member of the board looks through a folio of papers. This folio comprises your history. The board read it to themselves and mutter to themselves, then, with an air of suspicion, as if they didn't believe for a moment that there had ever been anything the matter with you, one of them tells you to take off your coat. You now shyly approach them from the row of clothes hooks where you have hung your trappings, minus dignity and rank, which of course you have left on the sleeves of your tunic. They've got you now and they know it. They ask you how you feel. You are mesmerized into saying cheerfully, 
quite all right. One of them produces that Y-shaped silver tube thing, and fitting it to his ears he insinuates the loose end into the opening of your khaki shirt. A moment or two of this, then the board exchange mystic words and finally start writing on blue paper. One of them looks up and says, that will do, you can put your coat on. You retire to the clothes rack like an artist model and put your tunic on again. The board suddenly, two months light duty. It's over. You know your fate and to creep from the room is all that remains to be done. I left the room with as much military demeanor and nonchalance as I could summon, but on arriving out in the stone corridor, I found that that flapping noise I heard behind me came from my braces, which I had omitted to put over my shoulders before replacing my tunic. It just shows how nerves can bring about one's undoing. I regained the entrance hall and thence passed out into the open air. Two months light duty. Well, that meant a return to my regiment's reserve depot. I hadn't been there since the start of the war, and now I was going back after many months of wanderings, trials, and adventures. I was keen and interested at the thought of going. Those faraway days at the beginning of the war seemed weird, romantic memories. Days when we had marched around and drilled and played, each day awaiting the command which we all longed for, the command to be sent to the front. I had left for the war a second lieutenant, from a bell tent in a sodden field. I was now returning a captain, with six months' war behind me. The second lap of my war race was beginning. End of chapter 2 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 3 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Barron's Father This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 The Depot Barracks and Botany Settling in the Isle of Wight is my regimental depot, and very nice, too, you might think. But you must not confuse the wartime Isle of Wight with the peacetime version. White flannels, yachts, and romantic hotel life punctuated by regattas were all sent west when the war began. Now you have a mighty armed camp, one congealed mass of khaki. You can't escape. The island is quite small, so you must cheerfully resign yourself to living under the full force of British militarism. It had all changed immensely when I returned this time. The old primitive collection of bell tents whence I had sprung had disappeared, and my battalion was now housed in red brick grandeur. There are large and spacious barracks at the depot, and latterly a myriad of supplementary huts. All this change was distasteful to me. No doubt things were more comfortable and all that, but I missed the old haphazard primitive tents and the sodden field. Things had become more businesslike and definite. The buccaneering glamour had gone. Well, I returned to the island and reported myself to the colonel. Reporting yourself to anyone means that you've got to find him first. Not always an easy manner at large regimental depots. An old soldier, however, gets a few elementary rules into his head for this job. If you are looking for colonels, try the orderly room first. If you are looking for second lieutenants, try the ante room. If you are looking for captains, have a look at the leave book before taking any further trouble. I went across the enormous barrack square, that gravel desert which seems essential to military incubation, and entered the orderly room. There I found the colonel, the adjutant, and a host of minor stars. They had had notice that I was returning, so had plenty to say when I turned up. Glad to see you back again, said the colonel. Hope you're better. I have known this colonel for a long time as I was in the same battalion with him on militia training before the war. He and the adjutant had evidently settled my fate long before I got there, for I was at once posted to a company and given all instructions. I left the orderly room and set about looking for quarters. I found the quartermaster and also found there was a fearful rush on quarters. The prospect of no quarters didn't in the least disturb me, and never more in this life will disturb me. To one who is thoroughly versed in rolling oneself up in a Macintosh sheet in the Clayhoe in Belgium, no quarters conveys nothing disagreeable. Leaning against one of the barrack blocks in a greatcoat for the night is good enough for me. A week in a greatcoat under Westminster Bridge is better than one night in some trenches I have known. 
Since I had left the island to go to war, the military outfit there had grown enormously. The number of officers was treble what it used to be. All the large officers' buildings were full up. I got hold of a hut that night and kept a greedy, jealous eye on a certain upper chamber in the main block of buildings. The owner, a captain, was about to leave for the front, so they said. I met him in mess frequently and took an immense interest in his departure. He had been out before, but had now finished his light duty and was waiting for the word to go out again. One day he went, and I got his room. I know of nothing with the exception of a base camp quite as distressingly plain and uninteresting as the average barrack quarters. This room I had got was the plainest of plain cubes. It had the barest necessities in the way of furniture, a large plain window, no blind, no carpet, and a small wooden board hanging up on which was printed a list of the meagre articles which had been supplied by the quartermaster's stores. I don't mean to say that this was a unique room. All barrack rooms are the same. After all, why should they be different? They are only meant as a case to contain you at night, to keep you safely till the next day, when the adjutant gets you in his grip again from about 6 a.m. onwards. You mustn't look for domestic pleasures in an army. You are one of a vast horde of trained gladiators. You are only alive by an accident. The proper use for a soldier is putting him on to shooting, clubbing, or sticking someone else who happens to get in the way of his country's welfare. Unless he is in one of those attitudes, he is wasting the country's money. A certain amount of time is, of course, allowed for perfecting these arts. Anyway, bothering about such things as window blinds, carpet on the floor, etc., is sheer froth. This necessary simplicity and Spartan atmosphere doesn't end with your room. In fact, you'll soon find out that this forbidding cube is about the best place in the whole barracks. Your window looks out onto about six acres of gravel. Round this barren waste are ranged a series of oblong red brick blocks like so many workhouses. It is here that the soldiers are kept. Behind these outrageously ugly buildings are others nearly as bad, but not quite. They comprise a variety of offices and stores. The chances of the owners of living there longer than an ordinary soldier puts in generally lead them into such anti-military acts as growing a geranium in an empty ammunition box in the window, or training a bit of something up the wall. Three sides of the square have to put up with what I have described above, but on the fourth side you come to the piece de resistance, the officer's mess. It is just like the other huge blocks in shape, but has a few extra adornments stuck on the front. You generally have to go up some steps to the entrance hall. Some garden beds are under the windows. Perhaps some tender-looking pansy faces gaze out from amongst a geranium or two. What a mockery! Pansy faces and geraniums for a soldier. His job is gravel squares, rations, feet inspections, and shooting or getting shot. Away with all this sentimental pansy business! The two main component parts of the officer's mess are the ante-room and the mess-room. They are both plain, but might be worse. I'll take the ante-room first. It is very large and furnished, mainly with leather chairs and divans, tables for matches and ashtrays and tables for papers. The wall decorations nearly always consist of one or two portraits of royalty or famous generals, an engraving of Wellington meeting Blucher, and the intervening spaces are filled up with subscription lists for things you haven't either the time or the inclination to take advantage of. Now the mess room. Empty except for several long tables and a sufficient number of chairs to accommodate the surging mass of officers which debouches into the room three times daily. This is a barracks, and this was where I now had to put in two months, light duty. When you are in a precarious shell hole, with shrapnel squibbing overhead at 4 a.m. in France, you look back on barracks as one of the bright spots of life. When you get back to those barracks and have had a week of them, you'd pay quite a handsome sum of money to be miraculously transported back to the shell hole. Anyhow, that's how I felt after the first week of two months' light duty. End of chapter 3 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter Four of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Bairn's Father. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four, 
Take over a company. Old soldiers' tricks. Company payday. Being on light duty, my first job was to be put on to a company which also went in for light duty. A couple of companies were kept there in those days, which were composed entirely of men who had been out to the war, but who, having been either wounded or temporarily invalided, had gravitated back to the depot. I was posted to one of these companies, and was now therefore responsible for its entire welfare. There were several men there who had been with me in France, men who had been through the winter in the trenches, and who, at varying dates, had been wounded and had left the front in consequence. The whole company was a collection of has-beens. This company of mine, I'll call it X Company, was not remarkable for a thirst for barrack life work. It was astonishing how bad those old wounds became on the day that the route march came round. But how could you blame them? They had all had a fearful time in France, and really did deserve a bit of a slack. To get them completely fit again was the main point, and this with the minimum amount of toil to them. I confess I am leniently inclined to these people. I think others who have been out and had some feel the same. But at that period there were a good many in authority who had not been to France, and who consequently had little sympathy for easy work. Everyone now has been out, but the time I write about is late 1915. Those veterans I had in my company were the most work-evading group that ever existed. Yet if they had been ordered out to an attack they would have sailed into it with the good old original Battle of Mons spirit, or held any line till all was blue. I love those old work-evading, tricky, self-contained slackers, old soldiers. They are the cutest set of old rogues imaginable, yet with it all there is such a humorous, childlike simplicity. They can size up their officers better than any Sherlock Holmes. I'll guarantee that an old soldier will know to a nicety how dirty he could keep his buttons without being hauled up by his new officer after doing one parade under him. An old soldier will pinch a tunic from a man in another company because he has pawned his own, and come on parade with it entirely to deceive you temporarily. If you were lying wounded in the middle of a barrage, that same man would come and pull you out. And good old Bill belongs to these lovable humorists. Total outlook, as little work as possible. Total ability, fight like hell and can't be beaten. Many is the time I have come across their quaint and cunning tricks amongst themselves or directed against me, and many a time I have had to go off behind some huts to laugh it out to myself. Company work is all right, but company upkeep is another matter. This company of mine was about two hundred strong, and when I took over I was, of course, immediately put in charge of all the documents and books which appertain to the looking after of a company. Now this is where I am no good whatever. I do not think that I shall ever live to see a day when I can say I understand that backbone of the army, the pay and mess book. It is only one of a set of books necessary to company upkeep, but it has an atmosphere all its own. It consists simply in a statement of what a soldier ought to get, and what he does get, and I think you subtract one from the other, I'm not quite certain. Sounds simple. But it's only about one case in a million that a soldier does get exactly what he is theoretically entitled to. He has either borrowed some in advance, been fined, or has had some compulsorily deducted at the request of a turbulent wife. This makes the interior of the pay and mess book a treatise on mathematics to me. If you are a half penny out at the end of the week, you spend an afternoon with your quartermaster sergeant trying to find it. You would willingly pay the half penny yourself and call it square. But that doesn't do at all. Throws the whole thing out. At about 4.30 p.m., when all signs of troops have melted away, everyone has gone to play, the sun is shining outside, and distant laughter comes from the football field, Quartermaster Sergeant looks up from the pay and mess book and, turning to you, says, I've found it, sir. He points a perspiring finger at a penciled halfpenny in one of the columns and explains that there is a halfpenny due back from Mrs. Dubbs, the washerwoman on behalf of Private Stickleback's shirt, which ought to have gone to the wash, but didn't. Relief. The pay and mess book is now temporarily correct and can be put away. Only temporarily, though. It is going to come out again next time you pay out. This paying out comes once a week. X Company got paid on a Friday. 
barring the part where you have to carry a couple of sacks of assorted coins up from the bank to do it with, it's a comparatively easy job. This is how the whole operation goes. Friday comes. There's going to be no parade in the afternoon because it's payday, and after attending battalion orders at 2 p.m. in the orderly room, you were due to go to your sergeant major's hut and pay your company out. In the morning, whilst you were drilling your company, inspecting their huts, etc., you have sent one of your subalterns down to the bank, wherever it may be, with a check for the amount required. The officer goes to the bank, gets the money, and then tries to return with it. If he is in good health and hasn't any heart trouble, he will probably turn up with a sack of half-crowns, shillings, and sixpences before lunch, and have them ready for you. About a hundred and fifty pounds worth of nothing larger than a half-crown is a rotten thing either to walk or bicycle with. Orders are over and paying out time has arrived. You and the subaltern who is going to help you go to the sergeant major's hut. He is there ready for you. Likewise your company quartermaster sergeant who has covered a table with a G.S. blanket and has produced that bogey, the pay and mess book, and has laid it on the table. You, the company commander, now sit at the table and your subaltern shoots out all the money in front of you and starts making neat little piles of half-crowns, shillings, and sixpences. The quartermaster sergeant sits at your side, ready to interpret the mathematical enigmas in the pay and mess book. The quartermaster sergeant, by the way, knows everything there is to know about company upkeep, bookkeeping, and everything else. To me, he stands out like a human lighthouse in a sea of trouble. The company is now surging about outside the hut like hens waiting to be fed. Some of the bolder ones put their heads round the corner of the door and let their eyes feast on the dazzling array of half-crowns. They are frightened off by the sergeant major, who has now taken complete charge of the scene. He turns to you and says, Are you ready, sir? You hastily review the piles of wealth and murmur, Are you ready, quartermaster sergeant? He murmurs, Quite ready, sir. You then suddenly remember that you must get two witnesses to the paying out. These are hurriedly obtained, after which you say in a loud, truculent voice, Carry on, sergeant major. You've started. Paying out has begun. The quartermaster sergeant reads out the names. He does it like this. Eighty-four ninety-eight blobs. A face of avarice is framed in the doorway, salutes, and comes forward. Quartermaster Sergeant murmurs to you, Shilling, sir. You hand a shilling to Mr. Blobs, who takes it, forgets to salute, makes a left about turn and walks away, but is immediately stopped by the Sergeant Major at the door, who makes him go all through the motions of taking a shilling on payday again, this time correctly which is salute, take money, salute, right about turn, and exit. Private Blobs goes out and darts off amongst the huts to get into some lonely corner where he can figure out how much amusement and worldly benefit can be derived from that shilling. He should have had more, only he is being fined for having three days before slid a mattress from end to end with his bayonet in an outburst of untimely jocularity. Quartermaster Sergeant again. Forty-six eighty-three Perkins, turning to you. Six shillings, sir. You look up to see who this model of virtue may be who is entitled to all his pay, and you hand him six shillings with a thrill of admiration. He salutes and departs. Quartermaster Sergeant again. Thirty-two sixty-four Smith, freckled giant, shoots in at the door. Sergeant Major is suspicious. What's your number? Freckled giant. 2935 Smith, Sergeant Major, Quartermaster Sergeant, and Company Commander, together, petulantly. Wrong number. It's 3264 Smith we want. The real Smith appears and gets his money. And so the job goes on. Paying out X Company used to take me about an hour and a half. Paying is easy enough, but at the end you have to balance the books and enter things up. This, as I said before, may lead to anything. In my case, it generally led to another couple of hours grappling with figures. I think this must have been the fate of anyone who had X Company under his care. End of chapter 4 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 5 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Barron's Father This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5. 
barrack routine, a disciplinarian major, ordered to Salisbury Plain. Life at the front and life in one of these enormous English depots are two very different things, and so they should be. In the island, just as at all the other home depots for training reserves and recruits, the work consists of nothing but training. Other sidelines which go on, such as commanding officers' orders, payday, kit inspections, etc., are all necessary accessories to the one great important feature which is tirelessly being carried out, and that is, providing a ceaseless flow of efficient men for our great armies in the field. When at a depot, you are regarded as an amateur learning the art. When in France, you are there as a professional. It is therefore easy to see that the mode of life and work must be very different in the two places. I must say I prefer the front. I think everybody does. There is something very adventurously attractive about being in a real war. There are times, though, when I admit frankly that I have thought the adventurous side a bit overdone. Being sprayed with machine-gun bullets whilst you are lying in an insufficient fold in the ground at dawn in a thin drizzle throws up the life of a bank clerk in a delicious bass relief of security. As time went on and my light duty was waning, I was shifted to a more arduous company. I was now much better, but far from quite right. Anyhow, I was better, and was now on quite a different line in companies. This time I was posted to a recruit company full of activity and ambition. I was a company commander, but two companies were clubbed together and the whole outfit was under a higher command, that of a major. Some major, too. One of the real old chutney variety. The old British army epitomized. One felt something like a Zulu must have felt at a witch hunt, when the devil doctors smell you out to be thrown to the crocodiles on one of his parades. I don't know who was the most frightened, my company or myself. I think I was. Discipline was and is his motto, and quite right, too. There's nothing like it for winning wars, but it's damned uncomfortable when you are on parade. If that major thought you a bit shaky about company drill, out you'd come, and there, standing in the middle of the square, you'd have a good chance of improving yourself. And moving companies about a square is no easy matter, as all who have tried will know. It's easy enough to start them moving, but to move them where you want to, and get them back where you want to, aye, there's the rub. You stand about the center of the gravel desert, and with one mighty lung-tearing shout, you order the company to move. Before you can think of the next command to get them back again, and before you have recovered from the first exhausting vocal outburst, the company is marking time against the barrack wall as they can't march through it. Baron's father, you must give your commands quicker and louder. Blush, and try again. In the evenings when all this strafing was over, I and a few pals went off down in the town about a mile and a half away and played about till time for mess. At weekends we progressed further and perhaps went over to Cowes, Ride, or Ventnor. So as the time went on I was slowly getting through my light duty and the question was now looming up, what next when this is finished? In the ordinary course of events I should be put on the list of those ready to return to France again, but, of course, date uncertain. Anyway, the prospect of nearing the end of my time at the island was exciting. The idea of something new happening, of some new move in existence, always cheers when one's bored. I was bored. There's a very bottled-up sensation in the Isle of Wight after you have been there some time. It's aggravated by seeing one's pals disappearing out to the front at odd moments on the receipt of telegrams. You, yourself, somehow always seem to be the last to go. It's strange the magnetic influence of those torn and mutilated plains of France and Belgium. I can see the old cracked remnant of smelly pig farm in my mind's eye as I write, and I feel I want to be there. One day the call came. A telegram came to the orderly room and it contained a message for me. To go to the front? No. I went to the orderly room and there heard the worst. I was to go to a new division then forming as machine-gun instructor. A good job, I thought, as I had been a machine-gun officer all my time in the trenches so far. I found out all about this division, or rather as much as I could, and eventually when I was to go. It appeared that I had to be off as soon as possible. 
That evening I packed my traps and pondered on the coming move. Machine gun instructor to a new division. A division that would shortly be going to France. An interesting job, forsooth, and as I had had a pretty varied experience in this business from the practical point of view, I felt that I could be of some use in this new departure. My Isle of Wight job was over. So was the light duty, and now I was bound for a new division somewhere on Salisbury Plain. I knew also that I was taking another step in the direction of the front. Soon I should be back again, back amongst the dilapidated estaminets, the shattered chateaus, the land of bullets and billets. End of chapter 5. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter Six of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Bairn's Father. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six Handing Over Arrival at Divisional HQ. I dig myself in. Instructions for most military movements are run on the same lines as instructions for attending medical boards. You get a curt wire about two hours before you have to start. As a general rule, the more drastic the move you have to make, the less warning you get. For instance, if you have got to be at a lecture one day, you will probably be told about it a week in advance. If you've got to go to the front, which entails packing, collecting everything you may need, handing over your company and saying goodbye, you will probably get a wire half an hour before starting. This exodus of mine to the new division was arranged just in this way. I had to shin off from the island with the greatest rapidity. I collected all my worldly goods and handed over my company to another captain. Handing over meant, in my case, palming off a set of disorganized accounts and paying for all losses out of my own pocket. I forget exactly what it cost me this time, but I know that running a company is an expensive amusement unless you are very careful. Early one morning my valise and I set forth on this new life. We left from cows, and watched the island fade into the mist as we glided up the Solent. Salisbury Plain was where rumor said this new division lived. In due course, I arrived there. Pretty vague that, I know, for Salisbury Plain is a vast expanse, larger than something or other, and nearly as big as anything you like. No, the Germans are not going to get any information out of me. At the time of which I write, Enormous numbers of soldiers were quartered all over the plain in different parts. It was winter time and phenomenally wet, so it really represented life in a leviathan bog. There were many divisions there. Each, of course, had a divisional headquarters, and then each divisional headquarters had a divisional general. It was just like a lot of bees in several different swarms. Each day the bees would all stagger forth into the treacle roundabout and mix with each other, practicing field days, route marches, and all that sort of thing. And at night all the different hives would swarm round their various queen bee divisional commanders again. It was to this humming hive of industry that I came. I arrived at the station frequented by my particular swarm, and inquired the way to their hive. The divisional headquarters was, I found, about three miles from the station. I got hold of a taxi and putting my traps into it drove off through the squalid little town out into the country towards Divisional HQ. This part of Salisbury Plain I was in was certainly one of the best parts, but there is not much choice. Except for the fact that it isn't shelled and mutilated it is nearly as bad as the front to look at. In fact, if someone would lend me a couple of howitzers for a day I could make quite a passable imitation of the Somme Valley near Freecourt out of Salisbury Plain. I drove along in the taxi, full of interest, combined with a certain amount of nervousness at the coming new job that lay before me. It was all so very different to the front. It's far easier to be one of the crowd doing a real job and putting everything you do to a practical and immediate use, than having to demonstrate the same things to warfare students in the security of Salisbury Plain. The HQ of the division had a very charming house situated in very charming grounds. HQs always know what they are about as regards where they are going to fix up. No bell tents for them, and quite right, too. For the complications and impedimenta necessary for running a division, particularly a new one in course of formation, are beyond comprehension. I shot along the curved gravel drive in the taxi and pulled up in front of the noble front door of the mansion. Here I was at last. No hope of escape now. 
Having discharged my taxi, I entered, and broke the news of my arrival as gently as possible. As luck would have it, there was already an officer doing the job I was booked for, and although he was leaving to return to France, his departure had been postponed for another week. This was very fortunate for me, as I soon found out how he had arranged things, and what was the correct method to adopt. He was a most expert machine-gunner, and had put in a long and arduous time in the Ypres salient. He had been wounded at Ypres on the same day on which I received my knockout at the same place, although he was, of course, in another regiment and in a different part of the show. I went to see him the night I arrived, and finding him down at his hut, talked the whole thing over. For a week I lived up at the divisional chateau, and daily absorbed his methods for instruction. At the end of that time he left, I bagged his hut, and started on the job by myself. A point which may strike readers here is, why bag his hut when you are living at the chateau? There were two reasons. First and foremost, I far prefer a hut to a chateau. I am much happier in a matchboard box with a corrugated iron roof and a smoky stove than in one of England's sumptuous country house bedrooms. My line is rough, straightforward, masculine freedom in simple surroundings, and I deteriorate mentally and physically to a ridiculous degree in grand houses. The other secondary reason for leaving the chateau was that it was getting rapidly filled up with more important people than I, and rooms were getting scarce. I went to the huts, as I have said, and felt better all round. The huts were attached to a brigade headquarters. A division contains a number of brigades. I was now living with a brigade, although on the divisional staff. End of chapter 6 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 7 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Barron's Father this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7. Those Field Days. Who's won? A Keen Division. It didn't take me long to size up this new division. It was just the most hard-working and keen division that ever was. But at that time, I think, the whole of Salisbury Plain was crammed with such divisions. It was composed almost entirely of men from the North Country and was just bursting to reach the last stage of proficiency and go out to France, or anywhere, to have a smack at the Bosch. When I arrived the situation was that at any time the order for the exodus might come. Training and final equipment was going on with relentless vigor. The work of the divisional and brigade staffs was enormous. Enthusiasm ran like an electric current through the entire concern. My little part consisted of getting hold of all the machine-gun sections of the division with their officers, and imparting practical tips for Prussian puncturing. I took a group out daily into the country roundabout and reconstructed actual front-line scenes and episodes, coupling it all with as good word pictures and advice as I could command. I took about fourteen men out at a time. We marched off into a new bit of country daily and there spread ourselves for perfecting the gentle art of machine-gunning. I arranged attacks of all descriptions on all sorts of places and at the end of an arduous morning sat in the middle of a perspiring group correcting faults and illustrating them with examples from my knowledge of the front. The rest of the division was almost invariably out on a field day or a route march. The machine-gun department nearly always worked on its own. Occasionally there came a great day of combined work in the shape of a full-blown field day, in which all the component parts of the division took part. These days, though very hard and tiresome, are generally tinged with humor humor arising out of pain, generally. This division I was with was great on field days. About a week before one came off, all the crowned heads of the division were given what is known as the general idea. This consists of a group of intricate documents laying out concisely what sort of a field day the divisional general is going to have, say, next Tuesday. Then comes the special idea. And finally, out of all this, the fact dawns on the mere regimental officer that on Tuesday next there is to be a field day when a brown force will be opposed to a white force, which is the invariable army method for distinguishing the two sides for the battle. For a week the staff officers have worked themselves to red tab shadows preparing for this monster game of hide-and-seek. The general's right-hand man, in army parlance, the GSO, one 
performs miracles of work on these occasions. At last Tuesday arrives. It is pouring with rain generally, but the plan is far too vast to be interfered with by any considerations of weather. The brown force has been set in motion against the white force, and now no power on earth except the general being suddenly superseded can possibly avert the ultimate collision of these two ponderous pieces of human mechanism that have now been set in motion. At about 6 a.m. the brown and white forces, numbering thousands each, covered with equipment and ammunition, exuding profanity and determination, stagger forth into the surrounding morass and disappear into the neighboring country. The two forces, of course, take different paths immediately. They will ultimately meet in a fearful mock collision, arranged by the GSO-1, in about three hours' time. The great charm about these onslaughts is that from the day on you never really know who has won the battle. There being no convincing argument, such as real barrages and devastating machine-gun fire, it is always possible for each side ever afterwards to prove to its own satisfaction that it won hands down. A whole battalion, with enormous self-satisfaction and consciousness of undisputed strength, storms a hill and refuses staunchly to believe, though repeatedly told, that a solitary machine-gun concealed in a hedge has entirely murdered them, in theory, whilst they were approaching the hill. In actual war, one is apt to get painful and convincing arguments of an exceedingly practical nature. At home, rehearsing, it's left to words and superior judgment. I have often thought that if only we were Spartan enough, what a valuable training a real scrap would be. There is nothing in the world illustrates better what a mistake it is to march in fours down an enfiladed road than a couple of real live machine guns at the end of it. The appearance of a red-tabbed military apostle in an apoplectic temper at the end of the said road announcing in uncomplimentary terms that the whole lot of you would have been simply wiped out leaves one cold. But anyway, one learns a lot on these field days. They are great training and endurance. Nothing could keep one in better training. My only comment is that they rarely, if ever, are the least bit like the real thing in the way of an attack. It is quite impossible to make them so. Other wars may have been a bit on the lines of a field day, but not this one. War wouldn't be half so bad if it was like a field day with all its marching and outplanking movements, etc. There is some sporting adventure and go about that. But the Germans have, wisely for themselves, taken to mud and mechanics and have thereby spoilt the true sporting idea of a battle. My division always threw themselves with wholehearted enthusiastic vigor into these field days. These were days before the great battle of the Somme. How little those fine chaps knew of the kind of thing the real field days would shortly be. I used to try, by means of sketches and word pictures, to give my machine gunners as clear a vision as possible of the front and what it means. But it's very, very hard, nearly impossible, to convey the correct idea. Nobody who has not actually been to the front can know what it is really like. And by going to the front I don't mean going to some headquarters and being taken to as near as it's safe, and then being given a pair of field glasses. A visitor to the front knows he can leave when he has seen it. A soldier knows that he can't and isn't going to. There's the difference. Being accidentally caught in a bit of shelling whilst visiting the front doesn't give you the idea either. You are buoyed up by the knowledge that a car is waiting back there near the crossroads to whisk you off to security and a good lunch. You want to be in a morning shelling, and then, having escaped when it stops, realize that you'll probably get the same thing again tomorrow morning. I have heard of people saying, when shown Ypres, that they thought it would be much worse. If they will come to me, I will soon tell them how to get that opinion altered. This division, of course, didn't know and couldn't appreciate it, but what they did know was that they were ready for anything and would go through anything. They fully acted up to it, too, in their splendid performance on the Somme a few months later. End of chapter 7. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 8 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Bairn's Father. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8. My Soldier Servant. Blob's Love Affair. Field days on the grand scale came off about once a week. 
The intervening times were filled up with all sorts of highly important training. So life for the division was one of ceaseless activity and hard labor. I used to be free at about 4 p.m., when I would retire to my wooden hut to have a rest, decide what I was going to do that evening, and plan the next day. It was the usual simple sort of officer's hut, and all I had inside was a camp bed, a washstand, a tin bath, and a table. My bag and valise were all my luggage, and they were in the corner. It was winter time and pretty cold, too, so a fire was urgently necessary in the little stove. A few days after I had adopted this hut for a home, I had procured my soldier servant. He belonged to a regiment coming from one of England's eastern counties. He was the most charming example of that rapidly dying class, the plowboy yokel, that you could possibly find. The whole simplicity of his life and mind, combined with the constitution of a rhinoceros, gave him a most lovable aspect to me. Until I caught this specimen, I didn't know that such things still lived, and when I found that they did, I was annoyed and troubled to think of the danger that such a genuine, simple creature ran, of having his outlook altered by this ideal-shaking war. He was about twenty years old and as strong as an ox, thick-set, short, with a healthy red complexion, he was just the sort of rustic type that, on the stage, sucks a straw and wears a smock. His head was delightfully thick as well. It took him a long time to fully grasp anything you wanted him to do, but when he had got hold of the idea and digested the fact that you wanted him to do whatever it might be, he went at it with the relentless vigor of a charging bison. This blossom hadn't done any soldier-servant work before, so all was new to him and I used to derive considerable amusement by knowing full well that he thought I was insane in most of my desires and tastes. I told him how to look after the hut and when to light the stove. He thought it all slowly over and then carried out these items with unfailing precision and thoroughness. I remember the first time when I told him I wanted a bath. He was standing in the doorway having finished whatever it was and was evidently waiting for me to tell him something else to do. Blobs, I said, I want a bath, hot water, do you see, and then fill up this tin thing here, I indicated the bath. In a queer, hesitating manner, he repeated, I see, you want a bath. I said, yes, I want a bath. He fingered the bath about a bit, half went to the door, and then stood looking at me in a hesitating way. After a few moments' pause, he suddenly jerked out, I'd better get it now, and disappeared like a jack-in-the-box through the doorway. He returned later with a vast volume of scalding water, about enough for three baths, all having been conveyed there by himself in a collection of canvas buckets. I wished I'd asked him for the bath itself as well. I'm sure he would have gone to some house and severed a porcelain one from its pipe connections and brought it along. He had no personal initiative but when guided and commanded he was nearly as good as one of those dear old genie in the Arabian Nights. Rub the lamp and it appears sort of thing. He woke me in the morning by a method all his own. I watched him once or twice with my eyes feigning sleep. He would bring along my clothes and boots and put them near the one and only chair. Then he would bring a pail of hot water and then hesitate a bit. He appeared to be thinking deeply. After a minute or two's hesitancy, he would suddenly come to the side of my bed, and say in a loud voice, "'Shall you be wantin' the stove?' This sentence, you will observe, combined waking me with getting instructions. Why he always did it this way, goodness knows. I soon ceased to try and probe into his beautiful mind. He interested me intensely, this man. I soon began leading him on into conversations about himself and about his private and home life. Later on I encouraged him into discourses on his love affairs. It appeared that he had a girl. In other words, he was a courtin'. Splendid, I thought. Now I'll get some funny stuff out of this cove. And I did. Conversation one morning conducted something like this. Have you had any leave yet, Blobs? I expect you'd like to go back to your home for a day or two, eh? Go back and see that girl of yours? Blobs, with a rubicund grin. Oi, I shouldn't off loike a bit of leave. The sergeant says the other night that he thought as ow oi was going soon, and 
bashfully. She won't off be pleased to see me, too, I reckon. Business of critically examining a roll of chillblains on the back of his hand. What did she say when you joined the army, Blobs? Blobs. Just afore I joined, she wouldn't speak to me. It was because I was driving Dad's thrashing machine down the road past her house. She says, Arthur, you never looks at me now that you are a driving that there thrashing machine. You see, she thought I was a doing the grand, soon as I got to driving Dad's big engine. One day I sees her by the rick in her Dad's farm, and I picks up a pitchfork, and I runs at her like this. Imitation, savage run with pitchfork. She says, why do you do that, Arthur? I says, cause I'm going to join the army, sis, that's why. So I chucks down me pitchfork, and she says as she was proud of me, and now she writes to me regular every week. That's right, Blobs, you stick to her and she'll stick to you. Now you might just go and get me a bucket of water as I want to have a wash before lunch time. Do a log closed. I've often wished that I could hear that that splendid simple country Jake got back safely to Sis and his thrashing machine out of all this devastating turmoil. End of chapter 8 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 9 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Bairn's Father This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 The Censor Defied Machine gun training, rumors of war, blobs gets into trouble. Now I wonder if I shall incur the odium of the authorities or prolong the war by saying where it was that we lived in those nice days on Salisbury Plain. I should like to say the name, as it was a nice place, the nicest in the neighborhood. I wonder if I dare. Shall I? No. Yes, I will. It was Sutton Veeney. The German mark goes up in value on all the exchanges. Consternation in Wall Street. Wish I hadn't said it now. Well, I've done it, so there you are. Sutton Veney was the place. A delightful little English village it must have been before all we khaki locusts settled upon it. It was quite a pleasure having all this military training set in such delightful surroundings. The headquarters themselves possessed most charming gardens. But as I have said in a previous chapter, such luxuries always seem painful to me. Mailed fist work and charming gardens are so desperately out of harmony with each other. Yet all the Sutton Veney times seemed mighty pleasant to me. Perhaps it was that I had not long since come out of that drab whirl of events, the front. Houses without roofs and chateaus turned inside out still lingered in my mind's eye. On the whole it was a short but happy time at Sutton Veney standing out with pleasing brightness in all my war life. I do not write all this sort of stuff which you've just read, or slurred over, with the idea of demonstrating that I am thinking different from anyone else about war. I do so in the hopes, and indeed with the knowledge, that there were and are many who have looked on their various war experiences in the same way that I have. I was merely a common or garden captain, leading a common or garden captain's life, and now as I write, I wonder why the Diabolo I have the cheek to write about it at all. I have apologized once in the preface of Bullets and Billets. I won't do it again. Here at Sutton Veeney and all over the plain, thousands of men were leading the most arduous and dullest of lives imaginable. It was a new picture altogether to me. Previously I had seen only the practical application of warlike skill. Now here, at Sutton Veeney, all the technique was being acquired. In my daily work with the machine gunners, I used to make desperate attempts to brighten up the job for them by giving them as vivid word pictures of the front and its ways as possible. Occasionally I organized and ran a small battle in some part of the surrounding country. This led to quite exciting times. I galvanized the opposing gun teams into enthusiastic action by means of prizes and competitions, Whilst all this training was in progress, an assistant trainer joined me, a second lieutenant who had been wounded and was on light duty like myself. He was a most efficient machine gunner. In fact, I have never seen his equal at machine gun mechanism. We both went out and each took a hand in the competitions. Over a wide tract of variegated land, two sides, composed of two gun teams in each, would attack each other. 
we invented a series of rules so that decisions could be arrived at and then had breathlessly exciting mornings we crept about the country after each other and butchered each other silently round hedges and ditches until the overwhelming superiority of one side over the other became apparent owing to someone sticking a head lathered in mud out of a culvert and announcing we've been enfilading you for at least half an hour dispute verdict then fall in on the road so we'd all march back to barracks beguiling the tedium of the way home by arguments as to which side had really won things were now getting pretty shipshape with the division all round the air was full of rumours sample rumours i hear we're going to egypt or i shouldn't be surprised if we had orders to go to france any day now all this made life much more interesting and exciting leave was being granted in great profusion which was a good sign it looked as if they were trying to let everyone have home leave before going out the whole circus was bristling with equipment and excitement amongst the gentlemen to have leave was mr blobbs my servant that dense but happy rubicund face burst into my hunt one morning and gave forth the following sergeant says as i'm in the next lot for leave are you blobs i said that's a good job you'll be able to go along and see that girl of yours and go for a spin in your father's thrashing machine if you're lucky a bovine grin followed with that's right sir in due course blobs got his leave and went to his home in suffolk like all good soldiers he of course overstayed his pass always suspect a soldier who comes back on the day he's been told to then like all good soldiers he had to be hauled up and punished the first step in this procedure consists of the offender coming up before his immediate commander in this case blobs had to be got at by me he had returned two days late so i sternly asked him why well it was like this sir he replied me and my mate started to come back the day as was on the pass for us to come back and we left barry st edmunds in the morning to come along to lunnon when we got there a bloke on the platform says to us where are ye for says he and i silly like says barry st edmunds and he took us along to a train and the next thing we was back at barry you see sir i thought as the man was askin us where we had come from not where we was a-goin to well there weren't a train back to lunnon not till night-time so we comes on that and we got to lunnon about six o'clock in the mornin me and my mate had never been to this here station before and we wasn't goin to ask no more questions again we'd had enough of being sent back to barry presently up comes a lady and she says as she would show us how to go she says where are you goin she says so i says sutton veeney so she says come along with me then and we went down a lot of tunnels to where the trains was a runnin into a ole like she says she couldn't stop but she says take the next train as comes in well sir i reckon we watched about half a dozen of them trains go out afore we got into one what made you do that blobs i inquired what did you want to wait there for well sir replied blobs this is how it was a carriage would come into the station shuntin like without any engine on and i says to my mate there's eaps of time i says the train can't go without an engine on and just as we was sittin on that there seat the carriage would go off by itself down the ole at the end i knows what it was now but you see sir i didn't understand anything about them electric trains as haven't got no engines and no more did my mate poor old blobs and mate they knew something about trains by now the knockabout wanderings that will have led them through southampton havre rouen amiens will have gone a long way to destroying the old world cabbage-like simplicity which at that time they possessed end of chapter nine recording by philip gould Chapter Ten of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Barron's Father. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten: The Final Polish, a One-Horse Township, in the Island Again. Detailed for Aldershot, the Old Guard. Now came a day of fearful excitement and anticipation. Not an order for the division to leave, but a much more delicate hint that departure was at hand. 
Sun helmets were issued all round. They spelt two things, the east and early departure likely. All was joy. The months of mud and training were nearly over, and now for the war. I was still on light duty, so was a bit nervy as to what my chances were of being allowed to go with them. I hoped for the best and looked forward with a buoyant interest to the departure. The time was now entirely filled up, so far as I was concerned, in machine gun firing on the ranges. We were served out with great masses of practice ammunition and a full rig out of guns, so the machine gun end of the butts gave forth a splendidly nerve shattering rattle for the surrounding neighborhood until we left. The inhabitants of Sutton Veeney, however, had no hope of escape. We were not the first division to be there, nor were we to be the last. When we left, another division took our places. The weather was terribly wet. We stood about in pouring rain, squirting lead into the hillside from our maxims for about a week. The entire division was firing all day long in ceaseless practice until the word came for departure. As is the way with all military movements, you never know exactly what is going to happen till it happens. Suddenly, all the sun helmets were called in. Hello! Egypt off, everyone thought, and they were quite right. The soldiers didn't mind where they went as long as they went somewhere. They were all for up and at em now. They would willingly part with all the simple little joys provided by the neighboring township of Warminster. They would cheerfully relinquish the pleasures of penny shows and cheap cinemas which grew thickly in the neighborhood. What they wanted now was to have a real live tryout of their skill and energy combined with all the romantic attraction of foreign parts. Every evening when work is over, the one idea possessing the minds of all soldiers is to walk into the nearest town. This crowd that I was with walked into Warminster, which was only about three miles distant from our huts. Apart from this, Warminster had little else to recommend it. In the dark winter evenings, with its anti-Zeppelin lighting arrangements and squalid streets, this little one-horse township presented as rotten and unattractive appearance as you could wish for. It served as a very good incentive to hurry back to the camps at the time requested by the authorities. The road from Sutton Veeney to Warminster was, at about 6 p.m., almost a solid mass of soldiers, all walking in to partake of the meager delights of the town. A few movable sideshows, seeking to add to the paucity of Warminster's attractions, had taken root in the fields on either side of the road. A few men were seduced off into these places, lured by the light of a naphtha flare, or the exaggerated announcements shouted out by a half-caste negro showman. The bulk of the division, however, got down into Warminster itself and flooded out the various cinema palaces. Rain, soldiers, mud and poor lighting, gaudy fronted cinemas with Charlie Chaplin posters, those are my impressions of Warminster. I went down several times whilst I was at Sutton Veeney. I suppose even now it is still the same old thing. Now that our departure was imminent I went down more frequently. It seemed to look a bit brighter somehow. Brighter, I suppose, because we were leaving. Anyway, the vast congealed mass of soldiers on the road were brighter. They knew they were going, and that was all they wanted. In a few days they left, and a finer division never went anywhere. About half of it was composed of Scottish regiments. So when the whole lot took to the road with their bands and pipes playing and skirling, the division presented as fine an assortment of British Army types as one could wish to see. The East was off, as the Sun Helmet episode had foreshadowed, and now it was to be France. On the day of departure I got my orders. I was not to go with them, as I had only been attached and did not belong to the division. Where was I to go? Back to the Isle of Wight, they said. I could have cried my eyes out, as they say of children. The Isle of Wight again. Oh, help! I should have liked to rush into the headquarters and to fling myself at the feet of the general imploring him to stay this dread sentence. Instead of which, I walked away amongst the huts and pondered on the advisability and possibility of stowing away in a machine-gun case or a blanket wagon, and thus getting over. The Isle of Wight. The Isle of Wight. Oh, curse the... No, I won't say it again. The division went. So did I, and although I didn't know it at the time, I too was to be in France within three weeks. I sorrowfully trekked off back to the island and rolled up to the red brick barracks on the square again. Things hadn't changed much. Several officers had gone, others had come, and the roll of honor in the ante-room had grown a bit longer. 
Somehow I found the island was not now so objectionable as I had anticipated. Couldn't make this out at the time, but I know what it was now. I was feeling better myself. My nerves were settling into a more placid condition. Sutton Veeney had done good. I had been a long time in getting right after my knockout at Ypres, far longer than I knew myself at the time. I became quite exuberant in the island on this tour, took a lively and active part in a series of soldiers' gaffes, which were held in the barracks. Merry shows these were. You suddenly find on these occasions that quite half the regiment are comedians. When feeling particularly hilarious, I am induced to give a song. And when I do, it always takes a comedy turn. Red nose, bowler hat, and umbrella effect, I find, is about my mark when I'm roped into a soldier's gaff. We were now having these convivial meetings about once a week, and I was invariably to be found at them. Huge audiences crushed their way into the large gymnasium and sang the choruses through clouds of smoke. Sometimes we took these shows over to one of the towns on the island, and one particular occasion I remember well when we did a show at Ride. The proceeds were, of course, for charity, and at this entertainment my job was to draw lightning sketches on the stage to be auctioned amongst the audience. Yes, I was altogether much brighter on my second return to the Isle of Wight. Just when I was really thinking that, Jove, this isn't half a bad place, I got orders to join a works company and take them to Aldershot. It's a curious thing that you always seem to like a place best when you know you've got to leave it. Join a works company and go to Aldershot. That didn't sound particularly attractive. I went to influential quarters and tried to get a reprieve. No good. Had to go. The works company was a sort of company used for doing odd jobs and dirty work, such as carrying uninteresting military objects from one place to another, clearing up mangled roads and being generally useful. Sort of scene shifters and stage carpenters to the army. They were non-combatants. Wouldn't have been able to be combatants if you'd paid them any amount. No doubt they had all fought splendidly in the Crimea, but I could see at a glance they would never wield a battle-axe against Prussian militarism. Dear old chaps they were. But taking them to Aldershot caused me great anxiety. I managed to get to Southampton without losing any in the Solent, but when arrived there had unfortunately very little time to catch the train which left the station a long way from the docks. This brought on a sort of rout of the company down the main streets of Southampton. Napoleon's retreat from Moscow appearance, or Chelsea pensioners' hundred yards handicap at the annual sports. It was a fearful rush, but thanks to the RTO who kept the train back a little we caught it, baggage and all and glided off to Aldershot. We arrived at Farnborough and apparently weren't in the least expected. We waited about for a bit, hoping for someone to say something about us, but as nothing happened, I lined the old guard up outside the station, stood them at ease, and went off to telephone in all directions to find out who would like a works company. In about a couple hours' time I found that the aerodrome at Farnborough wanted one. A lot of aerial goods had to be shifted. I took the company along to this place about a mile and a half away. Here in a worn-out field were a set of empty bell tents. We collared those tents and the company collapsed inside them in batches of ten. I went and reported the arrival of the company, found out what they were to do and when they had to start, and then set about arranging for their life there. It was first of all necessary to see about rations for them, also plates and cups and knives and things. Here was a works company, homeless and destitute as it were. Nobody knew, and nobody cared. We had nothing but a set of old bell tents pitched in a squalid field of the sort that you generally find round a gas works. I went off that evening to Aldershot, and by visiting several offices eventually obtained a permit to get a camp equipment at a certain store. I and the driver of a motor lorry I had got hold of spent a heated hour packing assorted bowls, plates, knives, and forks into the lorry and wrapping the lot up in straw. We then returned and tackled the local canteen for food. The outfit was now complete and the works company was saved. That night I got an empty room in one of the huts at the aero stores, and rolling out my valise on the floor in the corner, went to sleep. I awoke early as the floorboards were particularly hard in that hut somehow. A valise on the ground is all right, but is mighty hard on floorboards. I lay awake. 
thinking. Very much fed up with prospects now I was. I took another gold flake from the yellow packet always beside me and inhaled it as an antidote to temper. Curse this aerodrome. Why can't I go to France? I wish I had gone with that division. Later I rose and went on with my job of seeing to the welfare of the works company. End of chapter 10. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 11 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Bairn's Father. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11. Those Autograph Albums. Fits. A Wire from War Office. New Appointment. For a couple of days I stuck pretty solidly to my works company in my little wooden hut, as there was a lot to be done in getting the men's domestic affairs in order. And also I wanted to grasp fully the ins and outs of the whole job myself and to see what was required by the aerial potentates of the neighborhood. After a few days things straightened out, and I was then free to spend the evenings more or less as I liked. As I liked, of course, meant going off into Aldershot. I walked up the Farnborough Road and in due course reached the Queen's Hotel. Many of my readers will know this resort of the elite. I admit I am at times lured by a whiskey and soda, but in this case I expected a letter or two as I had given the hotel as an address. Not knowing the neighborhood, it was a good central spot to call at. I went in and up to the box office. Any letters for me, I ask? Sweet maiden with a smile and a brooch made out of a second lieutenant's metallic star called from a British warm. Are you Captain Baron's father? Guilty, me lord. S. M. with S. Only a bit wider. Here are three letters for you. And I wonder if I dare ask you. But would you be awfully good and put something in my autograph album? Any little thing will do. I smilingly reply, right -o, with pleasure. False creature that I am, I don't say that that makes the five hundredth album I've seen and that the sight of one more will make me commit some diabolical atrocity. I can't say that, as the owners of those five hundred albums would think me stuck up, and I should hate to be thought stuck up. So I take the Morocco-bound volume centered with Shem el Nassim, with the golden word album scrawled about its convex padded cover, and turn over the multicolored pages in the hopes of finding one on which it may be possible to make a rapid scribble. I held converse with the damsel, and then had dinner. By easy stages I returned to my wooden hut, slipped myself into my canvas scabbard, i.e. my valise, and went to sleep. Next morning, as usual, I emerged into the daylight and confronted my works company. I found them standing in two ranks at a variety of angles, and I proceeded to inspect them. I had to be careful whom I spoke to about dirty buttons or no buttons at all in that group. I knew by rumor that at least one member of the party went in for having fits. I saw a fit in progress on one occasion, but owing to the crowd surrounding the patient I couldn't see what he was like, so I never was able to recognize him on parade. I wasn't going to risk a strafe on buttons which might end in one member of the party flipping about on the ground like a landed trout, particularly in front of the commander of the aerial stores. I had hardly begun the parade when an orderly approached from the main offices across the field. He handed me a military telegram. Having squirted out that time-honored formula, Carry on, Sergeant Major. I turned away to read the wire. I can't remember the exact wording, but it was very much to this effect. Captain Baron's father to proceed at once to join the expeditionary force. Staff Captain, 4th Army Railheads. I nearly had a fit myself, then. My great wish had been granted. I was to go at once to France and be amongst the real stuff once more. But what was all this about Staff Captain and... Fourth Army Railheads. All that was Greek to me. I felt frightened of the job. I knew the ordinary regimental front, but this staff captain business was something quite different. However, I didn't worry about that. All I cared about was the fact that I was going out. It's a curious feeling, this wanting to go back. Nobody could possibly want to go back to life in the trenches or to participate in an offensive if one looks at it from that point of view alone. But it's because all your pals are out there at the front, and all the people who really matter are at the front. That's why you long to be one of them, and in with them, in the big job on hand. 
The satisfaction of feeling that you are in the real, live, and most important part of the war is very great. The feeling that you are amongst all the gang who have the nasty part to do and that you are accepted by them as one of the throng is enormous. But people must never be misled into thinking that just being out in France is sufficient to produce this feeling of satisfaction. Oh dear no! You must have been either in the infantry or the flying corps. Infantry is the thing. You can take your hat off to anyone in any infantry battalion anywhere at the front, to a distance of not more than two miles from the firing line. You can then be certain that you have saluted men who have gone to the hub of the show. Those are the chaps to be amongst. That I was to go to France again was my one great joy, but I could see by the wire I was not going as I had done before. I was now a staff captain. No more sitting through long days and nights in waterlogged trenches with Bill, Bert, and Alf. No more picking my way past the stiff and swollen cows at Dead Pig Farm on my way to the ration dump. No more sandbag filling on rainy nights. I was both pleased and sorry. Sounds curious, but it's true. I was pleased at the honor of being promoted to staff captain, vision of red tabs, but sorry I should not be one of the jungle folk of the trenches, as I always used to call them. However, I knew I should be right up close to the front and would see it all, and also I was glad to think that I should now be able to observe the war from a different and wider point of view. I was red-hot keen for going out, and forthwith began to set about making arrangements for handing over the works company. I left next day, and as the train slid out of the station I felt that now at last I was off to where this war life appealed to me most, the Isle of Wight, Salisbury Plain, Aldershot, all this was over. Now for France, Flanders, and adventure. End of chapter 11. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 12 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Bairn's Father. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 Overseas Once More Our Ever Growing Army Trains and Tribulations My Destination at Last. Being a rotten sailor, I was relieved to find that I was to go out at the narrow end of the channel, i.e., by the Folkestone Boulogne route. By setting my teeth and staring intently at some object on deck, such as a life belt or a deck chair, I can generally survive this passage if the sea is calm. A staff captain with red tabs and a red hat leaning against the bulwarks like a gymkhana dummy is lowering to oneself and encouraging to the enemy. I kept well, thank goodness, and staggered down the corrugated gangway at Boulogne in the most efficient manner. I have crossed to France about eight times so far in this war and up to the time of writing this have drawn it lucky. I walked down the wharf I knew so well and on past the Hotel de Louvre to the station. Near the AMLO's office, I don't know what that means, but countless thousands will know the place, I stumbled across a fragment from France right away. A war-weary Bert, elated by prospects of going on leave, was approaching the docks. He had just asked the French porter some question. A torrent of explanatory French followed. Our Bert, weighed down by haversacks and equipment, stood stolidly, listening and gazing intently at the porter. The verbal torrent ceased, and Bert slowly asked, And how does the chorus go? A slight effect, but it amused me at the time in making a mental note of the scene I drew a picture of it later. I got all my ticket business fixed up by the RTO railway transport officer, and found I had some time to wait for a train. I took a stroll through Boulogne. Very amusing it was to me. This was the place where after the Second Battle of Ypres I was put into hospital. This was the place where I stopped for a day when I first came out to the war. I mentally fought those days over again, but Boulogne was altered. Everywhere were the signs of the growing British Army. Things were looking more settled and businesslike. The primitive military arrangements which we had of necessity when the war first broke out were all gone. One could feel the ever-growing British Army was digging itself in, and slowly but surely settling down to make a job of beating the bounder Bosch. 
I lurked about the town for a bit and then returned to the Hotel de Louvre and had a final meal before pushing off on the train in the Amiens direction. All good trains in France seem to start in the evening, and you get to wherever you want to go sometime the next morning. I had never been to the battle area between Arras and Amiens before, as all my time previously had been put in between Ypres and Epinette, south of Armentier. This journey in a new direction was quite a novel experience to me. I found it just like all other wartime French journeys, twelve hours in an overcrowded first-class carriage with all the windows shut. The RTO had grasped where I wanted ultimately to get to and had made out one of those bilious-looking yellow forms entitling me to go to a place called Longpre. When arrived there I was possibly to be met by a car. Longpre conveyed nothing to me except I knew it was somewhere down Amiens Way. An overcrowded train pushed off from Boulogne sometime in the evening, and we driveled about through Etapla and Abbeville all through the night. I have done a fair amount of traveling in France in wartime, but if you really want a good sample of a boring journey, Boulogne to Amiens, or vice versa, is as good as any to experiment with. You leave Boulogne, late in all probability, and after gazing for about two hours at some grass-grown derelict railway siding just outside the station, the train moves on until you get a commanding view of a sodden cabbage patch in a fifteen-acre field, from which mammoth-fated wooden hoardings regale you with allurements such as Chocolat Meunier, or the Heliopolis Hotel Cairo, close to golf course. These are varied with the Lipton, or Heinz Pickles, fifty-seven different varieties. You now move on another hundred yards in the twilight and come opposite a vast yellow board with faded and scabbily chocolate-colored lettering, exhorting you to take Du Bonnet après le main. Sleep now overpowers you, and by means of balancing your head against the screwed-on ashtray in the Fumer carriage, you doze and finally slumber. You awake with a start, and remove your legs from the French major's lap who is sleeping next to you, and who, through continental politeness, has raised no objection to them being placed there. You rub your eyes and try to look out of the window. Great scare! What time is it? Wonder how long I've been asleep. Wonder if we've passed long prey. Your watch tells you that you have been asleep four hours. You rub the fog off the carriage window in a panic. Great Scott! We may have passed long prey and be at Amiens. As you can't see through the foggy window, you rise and open the one over the door. Some weed overgrown lines and the sharp end of a low platform are visible, but not a soul is about. Presently a figure looms out of the darkness and comes along the line at the side of the train. You don't know the French for, is this long prey? Long prey, monsieur, with as much interrogation about it as possible. Indignant answer from figure on lines. Non, 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 etaple. Merci, monsieur. You collapse into the carriage. Etaple. Caesar's ghost, Etapla. Why, that's the next station to Boulogne. Sleep again. The train rattled and jolted its shameless way into Longpre at about eight o'clock in the morning, as far as I can remember. Longpre is a ridiculously small place with an importance quite out of proportion to its size owing to the war. It happens to be a junction. I got out on to the line, no platform ever near the train when it stops and pulling out my meagre belongings after me deposited them on the track. There's something about the way a valise flops onto the grass-covered line that says, Here you are now, and it's going to be a, of a time before you go away again. I wandered to the RTO's office, a small wooden hut complete with telephone and maps. I told him who I was and where I was going. A very nice chap he was, too. He started off a telephone call to the place I was bound for, asking whether they would send a car or whether I should go on by train, and then invited me to have some breakfast in his place, which was a small cottage about a hundred yards away. I went with him when he had finished with that train, and after an excellent breakfast kicked around the place until an answer rolled up on the phone. The answer when it arrived was pleasing. Car was being sent and would be there at three o'clock. This was now the last lap of my journey. In a few hours I should start off for Montrelay, the place where I was to carry out my new job. The RTO had told me that Montrelay was my headquarters, but beyond that he knew nothing except it was a very small village on the way to Doulon, and that it was in my army area. 
At three o'clock the car arrived, and bundling my valise and bag into it, I started off for Montrelet, which was to be my home for some little time to come. End of section 12. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 13 of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Bairn's Father. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13. The Last Lap. A Peaceful Scene. Meet My Company. A French Bed. The car buzzed along the dusty country roads under the efficient guidance of an ASC chauffeur, and I surveyed the scenery at ease. It all struck me as so very, very different from the Ypres Armentier sector. This was far more France, and consequently prettier. The little villages amongst the valleys and the wooded hills and streams all combined to give an entirely different tone to the war in this area. I talked to the driver. Montrelet, I found, was a small village not far from Candace, which in turn was not far from Doulon. It was there that the present army administrative commandant had fixed up his temporary abode. How long he was staying there the chauffeur didn't know. He, the chauffeur, had to drive about all over the army area and knew it all, so I soon got the hang of things. I gazed around me at the scenery. It was really quite nice. For the first time in the war I was able to get an idea of the country in which hostilities were being carried on. That's the advantage of a staff job. If you are bound for the trenches in a battalion life your horizon is extremely limited. You go by night into the war zone, and your life from then onwards is cast amongst mangled estaminets, ruined villages, and trenches. On a staff job, although you see all the mangled up part, yet now and again you do catch sight of what the normal country looks like. It is a fairly hilly country about Montrelet, and the road twisted about amongst valleys and in and out of woods, until at last we reached a pretty little village with a few scattered cottages and an ancient church and turned into a farmyard. Hens hysterically scattered in all directions, and the car pulled up at the farmhouse front door. The village was Montrelet, and this farmhouse was to be my billet. My things were carried in, and entering the house I met a corporal in the hall. It appeared that the colonel was out. He had to be out nearly all day and every day, but would be back in the evening. So I left my traps in a heap at the foot of the stairs and strolled out to look around. This is a curious job I'm in now, I thought to myself. How different from my last time out here. Fancy being able to live in a house like this. For the house was certainly a good one. I have always thought that houses without the front torn out and a couple of holes in each gable end are much better than those possessing that doubtful decoration. This was a real old square-built farmhouse with the farm sprawling round it on three sides and a garden behind. Beyond the garden was a little old grey stone church which stood on the edge of a very large wood. It was a beautiful evening in early summer, and the whole outfit was really very pretty and peaceful. I strolled about the garden and mused around the church and wood. It struck me most forcibly as beautiful but sad. There was such a quiet melancholy about this place, an effect produced, I think, by the close proximity of war to this scene without that proximity having disturbed the place or knocked it about. Here was normal, peaceful French village life. Only a few miles away were the trenches before Albert with all the mangled-up desolation which surrounds them. Somehow I found the village of Montrelet on this still summer evening, with its little cottages in the sunlit valley, its old grey church, and the peaceful farmyard, had the effect of emphasizing the pathos of this devastating war in a greater degree than many a ruined landscape that I had previously seen. I returned to the farmhouse after my stroll around, and sat down to smoke in one of the front rooms. Quite a good room it was, with a lavish distribution of looking-glass in gilt frames, and a highly colored ornamental ceiling like the top of a Christmas cake. Presently a car rolled into the yard and up to the door. The colonel had returned. I felt somehow that he would be a terrifying person who would come into the hall and be heard saying, Fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman, or something on those lines. But he didn't. Instead he walked into the room where I was, and I introduced myself to him. He was as nice a colonel as ever I have met. A Scotsman in a Highland regiment. Discipline with understanding were his chief props, and he was a real good sort. 
I can always allude to him as the Colonel after this, which saves me putting down his real name or inventing a false one. Tricky fellows, these authors, you know. It was about 7.30 p.m. now, so it was dinner time, and the Colonel's Batman proceeded to get the meal ready. He disappeared into the room across the hall, and one could hear him working off crude French with a Scotch accent on the people of the farm. A pretty considerable quantity of this farm load of soldiers was Scottish, as I soon found. The Colonel, his servant, and a party of soldiers billeted in a loft, completed the military outfit which came from the north of the Tweed. There were a couple of other fellows who could claim nothing more than Middlesex, Essex, or Suffolk for their origin. The dinner appeared and was spread on the table by Clark, the Colonel's man, who darted about the room in a kilt full of timidity of the Colonel and a desire to please. We sat down to a plain but efficient meal, and the Colonel outlined the job that lay before me after which we got to discussing things in general, including, of course, the war. The Colonel, I found, had been serving in many parts of the show where I myself had been, and had experienced all sorts of wild and strenuous times. We coincided as regards knowledge of the front at Messines and Ypres, and I soon saw that he had had what the vulgar might term a skinful of the Ypres salient. So had I, and our conversation resulted in considerable mutual understanding. He had had a terrific overdose of hooge, a spot I have never been to, but I can thoroughly guarantee that part of the line is a first-class sample of modern war. For an hour or two we regaled each other with stories of trials, tribulations, and grim jokes, in the manner you will notice any two do who find that they both have known the same part of the front, and we laughed a lot about it, too. When one looks back on some of the pickles one has been in, they do seem funny. They are anything but amusing at the time, but everyone laughs at them after. I remember trying to smile in the middle of the second Ypres tornado, just to see whether my face could crack up into that facial contortion known as a grin. I was curious to see whether the death-charged and hateful atmosphere pervading the salient had permanently stopped my capabilities in this direction. I tried to think of something to smile at. I looked around me, as I lay in a fold of the ground under a machine-gun deluge and surveyed the scene. Crumphs! exploding in all directions, every house with the roof off or in the act of coming off, and then I thought, what a world. We build houses to live in and enjoy ourselves, and have doctors to mend us as much as possible, to prevent decease. And yet here we are, all trying to knock everything down and kill as hard as we can. I smiled at the incongruity. The Colonel and I aired these thoughts to each other that night, and we smiled again. I was to start on my job next day. I knew nothing about it as yet, but I was to go out with the Colonel in the morning to a railhead south of Albert, and so I would pick up what I had to do. We sat and smoked a bit, and then went to bed. It was a curious old place, this farmhouse, good old-fashioned rooms. My bedroom overlooked the farmyard and contained two huge wooden beds with canopy sort of structures sticking up at the pillow end from which curtains hang in regal festoons. I had my valise and boxes dragged upstairs, and by the light of a candle proceeded to dig myself in. The chief ingredient of a French bed seems to be a nondescript sort of a pillow eiderdown mattress. An enormous feather-stuffed cushion. It's a mile too large for a pillow and not large enough for anything else. What you are supposed to do with it I don't know. You are nearly smothered if you use it as a pillow and your feet would be frozen if you use it as a counterpane. Each of the beds had one of these monstrosities and feather beds as well. I decided to be continental and risk it. I chose the bed nearest the window, sank out of sight into the feathers, and pulled the other thing over the top of me. Thus enveloped, I went to sleep. End of chapter 13 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter Fourteen of From Mud to Mufti by Bruce Bairn's Father. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fourteen, My New Job, A Typical Day's Program, How Fragments Are Evolved. I discovered in the morning that the Colonel maintained an office in the place. What had been a sort of jam and pickle storeroom had been given over to us, 
and in these I found the colonel writing at one table by the window, whilst a youthful clerk encased in khaki was toiling at a tall sloping desk on which was strewn all the inevitable impedimenta of a military office. Blue forms, white forms, buff forms, and buff slips, all were here. A gaudy assortment of colored pencils and rubber stamps, files, and OHMS envelopes. In fact, everything that can bring joy to the heart of a quartermaster sergeant or an orderly room clerk. Now, I am sorry to say, I'm very poor at this sort of thing. In fact, it might be said, rotten. So I saw at once that to stay efficiently in this new job of mine without incurring the odium of British militarism, I should have to buckle to and pump up as much knowledge and enthusiasm as possible over all these buff slips and indent forms. The colonel, it appeared, came down very early and did a bit before breakfast, as he had to be out so much in the day. So I made a mental note. I must do the same. I turned over a variety of papers dealing with the work until breakfast was ready and tried to get the hang of things. The colonel at breakfast amplified my scanty knowledge by giving an outline of the job. It appeared that he was responsible for discipline on all the communications in the area, approximately between Doulon and Amiens. I was to be his adjutant, as it were. Each army has an administrative commandant, and each one of them has a staff officer. Now, I do not want to be confused with the real staff officer. By real, I mean those on corps, divisional, or brigade staffs. They are all combatant officers. My job was now on communications. I had got from strafe to staff, and this was as much staff as my physical ability at the time would permit of. I was a staff officer right enough, as per book of the words, but I never can consider anyone quite the real thing, quite the neat stuff, who is in any job other than the active strafing department. Of course an army must have people behind it. If you took the ASC away, the army would be done in a week. Anyway, this job was as much as I could do, and I soon found that it was going to provide me with a view of the war such as I had never had before. After breakfast, the colonel ordered his car round, and we both started off for one of the daily jobs. He had chosen Montrelay as his headquarters, as it was about central for the whole area he had to see to. This day we had about twenty miles to go, and this was my first view of the Psalm country, a country shortly to be made famous by our mighty effort, the Battle of the Psalm. It was very hot and dusty. The car buzzed along through long poplar-lined lanes and in and out of ramshackle dusty villages. The colonel, with a map spread on his knee, would every now and then shout instructions to the driver. Sometimes we were on a broad, wide high road, passing a whole stream of giant motor lorries taking supplies to the dumping grounds, and at other times going slowly through a billeting village crammed with dusty, khaki-clothed soldiers resting from a spell in the trenches. As we neared the front, all the villages seemed to be hives of soldiery. The land seemed alive with men in khaki, and out in the fields vast groups of horses were tethered or limber stacked in rows. Dust and ponderous motor traffic everywhere. Mile after mile we sped on through this varied scene, and now we were approaching the place we were making for, a certain railhead. What horrible, dry, dusty, uninteresting places railheads are, and how fearful it must be to be an RTO. Imagine a paltry French wayside station for a home. A railhead is a place where stuff of any description for the front arrives and is subsequently taken over for distribution by motor lorries and wagons. The station selected may be small or large. It all depends on the position of the trench line in that area. If the station is small, then an army of assorted huts springs up round it, and in these lurk the individuals who operate the railhead. Presiding over this industrious scene is the railway transport officer, or RTO. He is usually selected from the ranks of those who have done their bit, and are fit only for something a bit milder than life in the trenches. It all depends on the railhead as to what sort of a time this cove has. Some railheads have a frenzied hour's work a day, when everything seems to happen at once, after which there is nothing to do but take pride in the dandelions on the siding, or get on with the latest E. Phillips Oppenheim sent out from home. Other railheads never leave off being a pandemonium day or night. Six howitzers arrive from the Sinai Peninsula at four o'clock in the morning, or an army corps of Portuguese infantry are passing through and have to change at midnight. 
The railhead we visited the morning I write about was a cross between the two. There was a good bit of ammunition work to see to there, and that is a more regular sort of occupation. We stopped the car by a goods shed and the Colonel and I got out. The Colonel was monarch of all railheads. They were one of the units under his command. I trailed along beside him, absorbing the scene and trying to learn the job for the future. I looked around at the huts and at the station. A face, distorted by the hate of many inquisitive interruptions, suddenly appeared at a window and hastily disappeared again. I guessed it was the RTO, and I was right. The door of the hut opened and this potentate came out. We now, all three, had to evince an interest in the deadly dull details of the railhead. I have, of course, percolated through a host of railheads, so I will describe not an individual, but a typical one. A railhead nearly always gives you the impression that it is a station which the railway company had been disappointed with and have readily given away to the military authorities. It mostly consists of apparently inconsequent sightings, no platforms, and a row of uninteresting huts. It appears to be always a kind of derelict terminus in a forty-acre field. When it's not raining all day, this enthralling scene is enveloped in an opaque cloud of dust. The occupation of the inhabitants, moreover, is most inartistic and soul-destroying. Counting truckloads of rusty howitzers or tins of jam, anxiously regarding a prodigious quantity of fifteen-inch shells and wondering when they can be got rid of, those are the daily joys and sorrows of the RTO and his assistants. Added to these activities, he of course worries over an interminable correspondence which he finds on many colored forms, chiefly buff and white, which come floating into him from all parts of France and from every angle imaginable. For instance, we have as yet received no news of the trench mortar dispatched from Khartoum and last seen at Abbeville, etc. Or, regarding your indent for a drinking trough for sparrows at your railhead, please state size. The Colonel, the RTO, and myself, all three fully conscious of these dull and uninteresting shortcomings, but determined to serve our king and country, wandered round the railhead. The three parts played by the Colonel, the RTO, and myself were the Colonel, to summon as much mailed fist and military severity as possible and to frame cunning, terrifying questions to the RTO on the details of his work. The RTO, to attractively walk alongside the Colonel and be ready with a plausible answer, with a substratum of truth, for everything occasionally volunteering to show something which he had previously ascertained was in perfect order. Myself, to walk along looking as clever as possible and refrain from letting the least sign leak out that I knew less than either about the job. And so these visits proceeded week after week, and after each inspection the Colonel and I would return across the miles of that sad bleak country back to our headquarters at Montrelay. During this time I employed all my leisure in drawing further fragments from France. Jokes that appeared week after week in The Bystander, how little people know where they were made, and how. It somehow pained me, when I knew that the result spelt laughter, to think how often the idea had come to me through the infinite sadness of the Somme Valley. In the evenings I have often wandered around a mutilated little village, and gone off by myself to inspect the deserted and partially smashed church or the silent weed-grown courtyard of an old farm, and have sat and reflected on the whole monstrous conflict, and as often as not with that same feeling that prompted me to smile during the Second Battle of Ypres. I have smiled here, and thought of a ridiculous and amusing situation. Amusing to those who know, because founded on truthful pain, but merely like comedy to those who don't and can't know. I have now emerged from the war, and look back on a vast sea of episodes and curious incidents, but nothing strikes me more forcibly than the various and extraordinary places in which I have drawn my pictures, in weird, safe, dangerous, and unique spots, which range from the North Sea to Gorizia and the Austrian Alps, but of that anon. End of chapter 14. Recording by Philip Gould.